by the virus behind a pneumonia outbreak in the central city of Wuhan. At least 59 people are believed to have been sickened by the new virus. A new type of coronavirus. The number of affected countries has tripled. The World Health Organization has just declared that this is a pandemic. The National Coronavirus Command Council has decided to enforce a nationwide lockdown. It's Monday night, and about an hour ago, we witnessed our president make an incredible, incredible announcement, one that has dramatic and drastic effects. But we trust, and I do believe, it is the best decision for our nation at this time. 2020 was a year like no other. Economy struggled, security disappeared, and churches closed their doors around the world. But even though we as the church couldn't meet in person, that didn't stop God from meeting us. 2020 was the first time that Life Changes went completely online. We went from five in-person meetings on a Sunday to nobody in the parking lot, nobody in our buildings. The buildings may have been empty, but God's church is still on the move. This year, we've reached further than ever before. We preached the gospel to 46 countries and over 54,000 people across the globe. Even though the world was locked down, people's hearts are still open to the grace and love of Jesus. And we saw over a hundred salvations in the first two months alone. ever the church is the hope of the world and people are being added to our story raised up and strengthened in Christ we love doing life together and even though we couldn't meet as we normally would more than 320 people meet in life groups every week We are also passionate about seeing people walk in freedom and wholeness in Jesus Christ. 289 people joined our recovery groups where people found life and freedom from addiction within community. Not only do we believe that we should meet as a gathering of believers, but we also believe that we are called for mission and to release wide for God's kingdom. We saw a need and during lockdown level 5, we are on the move and pioneered the West Coast COVID Relief Fund. Through faith, we gave more than 550,000 Rand towards food for people in need and collected more than 31 tons of food. Not only did we help those in life changes in our broader community, but we spent almost 600,000 Rand beyond our borders. We were able to help churches and families in need and advance God's kingdom. Thanks to God's provision and our generous Life Changes community, we gave more than 1,100,000 Rand for the advancement of the gospel. In the midst of a global pandemic, we are still a people who are called to reach far, raise up, and to release wide for God's kingdom. We are the church. We are the people of God, the disciples of Jesus. We are the continuation of the book of Acts. We have the same spirit and we are not backing down, never settling down. We are flipping the script. Vision Sunday, and um, we want to show it again as we speak through our vision and reach far, raise up, release wide on this Sunday, speaking about releasing wide and so celebrating what God has done in this last year. It has been an amazing year. 
a challenging year, but an incredible year of God's grace and His goodness. And to all those online joining us this morning, it's wonderful to have you with us. To those in the room, it's amazing to see your faces. Say the person next to you, hello, beautiful. Check. Yeah, now, if you're single, just get a number and um, let's move on. It is wonderful to have you at church this morning. Um, I want to speak this morning. I want to re-speak the vision. We do this every year. We just speak to reach far, raise up, and reach wide. We preach it somewhat differently, and we present it differently. Why? Because vision is so important, but often it can get lost in translation. And I saw that last night. Um, I, I just checked my emails, and a payment went through to PlayStation again, two on the same day. Now, if you don't know, have kids, you won't know what that means. It means someone's been buying tokens. It's just what it means. Now, I went to my wife. I said, did you approve the tokens purchase? She said, well, one. And I gave her the two amounts. The one was bigger than the other. She said, not the big one. So she said, the conversation went like this. This is my wife. Daniel, did you buy tokens? Daniel went, yes, you said I could. To which Candace said, uh, but Daniel, uh, you said they were for free. He said, mom, I said there were three. <laughs> And things get easily lost in translation, especially when your son has a little lisp that sounds like free. So you just got to, we've realized we ought to clarify some things, repeat the conversation, have it over and over again, just to make sure, because there's no coming back from PlayStation moments like that. And some of you said to us, well, Gabriel used an image last, a wheelbarrow. I mean, he's never used a wheelbarrow in his life, but he used one <laughs> preaching, so that's fine. So I've got two illustrations for you today, just because... I obviously, I'm going to beat him. And um, the first one will be using this rugby ball. The second one, those buckets. Don't get too excited about the buckets. But I want to use something of a rugby analogy. Please forgive you if you're not a rugby fan. We hardly ever speak rugby. But I spent a lot of my life playing that. I know I didn't look like it, but um, it's been a while. But as we present this reach far, I was just thinking about how do I get people to understand why this is important to us? Please understand that all a vision means is why do we say yes to a whole bunch of things and why do we say no to a whole bunch of things? Why do some things seem to get prioritized and other things don't? Well, because that we feel is the vision God calls us to and the gospel calls us to at this time. So first of all, as we speak about reach far, which is really presenting that we're called to reach those who are far from Christ, demographically far, spiritually far, whatever far. Is, if people are far from Christ, there is a mandate on the local church and a mandate in every believer to reach them with the gospel and the love of Jesus. But I want to tell you that, uh, that there is no start up with everything else that the church can get involved in if we don't have this at the center. Reaching far is so central, it's like, without it, it's like playing rugby without the ball. I'm just going to tell you that, Mark, that's harsh. It's a strong, no, the mandate and the gospel and the great commission says, go and make disciples, reach them far and go to the ends of the earth and surely I will be with you always. There's a mandate and it's like playing rugby without the ball. If you aren't putting that mandate at the front of the list, that's why it's at the top of the list. Because you can do amazing things on a rugby field without a ball. I watch my boy do it. He practices side steps. It's but there's no one there, no ball. He, he, he can have all the kit. You can have the gum guard. You can have the headgear, the shoulder pads, the whole trip. You can, you can practice all the maneuvers, practice your sidesteps, your handoffs, and even your goal dive. I mean, you can practice the whole lot. But if you're on the field and you do all that without the ball, you're never winning. You're never winning the game. I mean, have you ever seen someone run, do a dive, and it's a problem if you don't have the ball. And it's just a very real truth about the game of rugby. If you never have the ball in your possession, you're never winning the game. And I honestly believe there is such a mandate on the church to be reaching those far from Christ that if we aren't doing that, it's like playing the game without the ball. And uh, if you want to know how passionate I am about it, well, that's how passionate I am. Secondly, there's this mandate to raise up. And as Gabe spoke about last night with a wheelbarrow of last night, last week, a wheelbarrow of dirt... That, that the raising up is the dirty part of the work. I had a rugby coach. He used to keep telling us, and please understand, I never played in the forwards. My clothes were often clean on the field at halftime. It's just how it worked for me. But that there was a group of people called the forwards. They're like dirty guys. They look like a bunch of MMA guys going after a ball in the middle of a field. And the coach shouting, just drive it up, drive it up. And they are getting dirty. They're getting stuck in. It's the messy part of the process. It's called rucking and mauling. And they're just driving it up, up the middle of the field. And it's the hard work. Raising up is the hard work. 
It's the discipling. It's, it's dealing with the mess. It's walking through the relational challenges. It's navigating that stuff, holding the ball that are the salvations God has given us and moving it forward up the field. It's not glorious. But the, the point that normally makes the highlights real on a rugby game is when the ball starts getting flung wide. And the scrum off gets the ball and he's passing it to those fit looking guys. Often their hair's gelled back like Cabos van der Vestes, and it's just like their hair's always in perfect nick. Their clothes are still clean at halftime. But when they get the ball, they're the fast guys. They're the ones who get the highlights real. They run around everybody, get all the glory. That's when the ball gets released wide. And I had a coach for years would tell us, you have to drive it up the middle. Keep driving it up the middle, making space. It pulls the opposition in. It pulls the attention of the opposition in. Then you move the ball wide so that we can score the points. And as I speak this presentation, I want to tell you the problem with that analogy often, and the problem in the church, I believe, is that often the highlights reel of church and the releasing wide of church is a preacher in a pulpit. It's a saint in a prayer room. It's someone drinking a nice coffee at church when I don't believe that is the highlights reel that God's called us to. For me, the highlights reel is a business person in a boardroom doing deals the way God would have them done. And the ball gets passed to that person. You see, they've been reached by the gospel. They've been raised up in community, and they're released into boardrooms. I was so amazed to, to see, I went on to uh, News 24 this week, and a big deal between um, Mr. Price have just bought Yuppie Chef for $460 million. You know why it brought great joy to me? Because the guy who signed that deal is my best friend. He was the best man at our wedding. And because I know that he was in that boardroom, I know that deal would have been done the right way. I know that people would have been honored. I know that there's an forward advancement of the kingdom of God. Why? Because there's a kingdom man in the room. That's what I know. I, I love it, and I want to challenge us that, that the, the highlights reel is that. The highlights reel is a teacher advancing the kingdom of God and raising up world changes. Sue Smith at Parklands College. Uh, uh, Carla van der Merwe at van, van Riebeck Strand. We've got Lee Muller who drives across town to Mitchell's Plain to go and teach in a very tough environment. Why? Because she is committed to raising world changes even in tough times. That's the highlights reel of the church. I'm telling you, we got it wrong when the only things we get likes on of Instagram is a preacher behind a pulpit declaring the gospel. That's part of it. But I'm telling you, that's more of a petrol station for the church to get filled up and fueled up and fired up. So we go out and get the highlights reel out there. And that's my job to provoke us today. Yes, I'm excited. I, I love hearing stories like this amazing man at the back there. Come out the shadows, my buddy, who has pursued a career and studied hard and succeeded in that career. But such a burning passion to see justice brought to our nation and to see injustice rectified that he's gone on a process of studying part-time while his wife was finishing her master's, while they had a baby, and while he tap dances at worship every Sunday serving you, studying law to then do his LLB, then to say, I'm going to give up this job and go take an internship job in a firm because I so believe God has called me to see injustice rectified. To see another young man in our church also studying law, now stepping into environments and spaces, taking a different job so he can see laws fashioned in our nation. That's the highlights reel for the church. That's the win. Often the challenge in life is we don't know what the win is. The win is a nurse or a doctor on the front line in the middle of a pandemic who's full of the Spirit of God, compassion and grace, full of courage in a time like this. That's the highlights reel of the church. I'm telling you, sometimes the church don't know what the win is. I went to watch Ben play his first rugby game in under eight rugby. Doesn't look like rugby at all. Until the one little guy named David gets the ball and he starts running. I mean, David, you just can't stop him. He is going. The only problem is he's running the wrong way. And his dad is trying to catch him on the sideline, realizing he wants to run on the field and stop him, but he can't. So David just runs the whole field, and the whole game's looking at him going, you know it's the other side. And I think sometimes at the church, we sometimes forget what the goal line is. We sometimes forget what the win is. And I'm telling you, in reaching far, the win is salvations. It's not just presenting the gospel. It's not just laying hands on the sick. We've done our job. No, it's salvations. It's healing. It's wholeness. It's the kingdom of God advancing. That's the win. And then there's a follow-on win called raising up. It's stories of God raising up people in the midst of community, taking them out of brokenness, pulling them into healing, giving them perspective of life and what kingdom normality is. And I'm telling you, it's the messiest part of the job. And then the win is releasing them for the kingdom of God. Come here, Oli. 
I can see we've got a visitor this weekend. Maybe you don't know him. But uh, I saw his face this morning. My heart lit up because this is the win. I don't know how else to tell you this. This is the win. His brother came to this church, and Ollie and his whole family, they, they, they weren't worshiping. They weren't here. They weren't part of the story. And then his brother preached the gospel, and Ollie gave his life, and his sister gave his life, and his mother gave their life, and they serving the life. His brother left, and Ollie continued to be fashioned in youth in this space, fashioned amongst community, fashioned with mates like that, uh, that hairy fellow chap over the back that was leading your worship in those white shoes. Became one of our young worship leaders, rising up. Just last year, leading life group, leading an incredible life group, leading worship, stepping up into more and more. And then he came and said to us, as he's a qualified dentist, I know dentists shouldn't look this good, it's a problem. <laughs> it's a problem. Um, but then he said, actually, God's called me and I've got to go do my uh, community service in Matuba Tuba. Anyone been to Matuba Tuba? It's not glorious. You have more chance of seeing a hippo in the middle of the road <laughs> than a kawaii. You just, just do. And yet there was such joy in my heart that a young man could be reached by a community and loved and raised up in community to be a leader. And in the, in the time we're just stepping into areas of leadership and influence, he can now be released out by community with shouts of joy. Why? Because the kingdom of God is advancing. How are you doing? Hello. Hello. <laughs> Morning, church. It's good to be, good to see familiar faces. Very good to see you. Amazing. Amazing young man. Thank you, my brother. But I just, I wanted to make sure we're speaking clearly this morning. I don't, I don't want to, is it free or is it free? I don't want that in the church. I want us to know what we're on about. What do we want to see? I want to see that over and over and over and over and over and over again in my life. That must be the highlights reel of this church. And I want to speak this morning, and I just want to do this. I want to take away excuses. I want to say this, no more excuses. I want to take a man named Jeremiah who's just... If you see his start, you almost can't align his finish to his start because at the start, he's so insecure. He doesn't feel called. He doesn't feel like he could add any value. He starts where most of us start. The challenge is you come to church and you think, this guy was born preaching. He was born with a microphone in his hand. No, I wasn't. I didn't want this job. I didn't want to do this. And God starts to speak and fashion a shape and takes a mouth that was used to cut people down because I struggled with massive small man syndrome at school. That the way I got through life was using this thing to cut people down to my size. God had to redeem, restore in community by reaching and raising up in community. Why? So that he could release me into what God's called me to. But he wants to release you into what God's called you to. It's the kingdom of God. It's bigger than the church. It's the forward momentum of everything God calls us to. Jesus knew this. He was telling a story, and it goes like this in Luke chapter 14. We're not going to put it on the screen. I just want to read it for you. Jesus replied, a man, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent a servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. Oh, there's excuses in the Bible. The first guy says this, I've bought a field. I've got to go tend to the field. The other guy says, I've bought some oxen. I've got to go look after my oxen. The next guy says, I've got a wife. I've got to go look after my wife. Please understand, all of those things are blessings from God. How often does that happen? I get my blessing from God, and I'm busy, God. And there's this analogy, there's this challenge that excuses keep us from walking into everything that God's called from us. And he challenges us, and he, Jesus tells the story about the master, and this story says to the servant to God, invites, he says, go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be full. He says, those guys you invited, and they said no, they won't enter. And I'm telling you, church, I did it for most of my Christian life. I made up excuses, like I'm not ready, I'm not good enough. It's the preacher's job. My job is to come to church, cheer on the preacher. My job is to come to church and give money to an offering. My job, no, that's, that's such a small part of your call. I'm too busy, I'm too tired, I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too poor, I'm too weak. This is what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet 
to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today, say today. Today I appoint you over our nations, over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, I sound like Daniel, overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see a branch of an almond tree. I replied, the Lord said to me, you have seen correctly, for I'm watching to see what the word is fulfilled. The word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? I see a pot boiling and it carries on. I want to jump to verse 17. Get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them, whatever I command you, do not be terrified by them or I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and over the people of the land. They will fight against you, but you will not They will not overcome you, for I am with you and will rescue, declares the Lord. It's this radical picture of a young man. This young man receiving a word from God to say, here's the thing, you're going to go challenge kings. His first excuse, I'm not equipped. And and I don't know you, but I've used this one lots. The first time I got asked to preach at Glenridge, I was a business guy. I love being a business guy, and I really didn't want to be a preacher. I got asked to preach on worship. 11 o'clock the night before I preached, I phoned the guy who asked me. I said, ah, I can't do this. He said, what are you talking about? He said, honestly, I've been preparing for weeks. It's been like pulling teeth. I can't do this. His name's Paul Spooner. He told me to get over myself, and he'd see me the next morning. See, Jeremiah said this, alas, sounds so nice, alas, sovereign Lord, I do not know how to speak. And it sounds so humble, eh? It's like, it's, it's, oh, what a humble guy, what a good guy. But he's called to this ministry. See, the challenge is God called him not to what his father and his grandfather had been called, which was to be a priest. God called him to be a prophet. The challenge with that is priests had predictable duties, and they had a pretty much predictable life. Prophets, nothing was predictable. A, a priest got to preserve the past, and a prophet got to... Challenge for change in the present and the future. It's not a comfortable job. A priest dealt with externals and rituals and sacrifices where the prophets came and challenged the hearts of people in a nation. A priest got to to minister to individuals. A prophet got to challenge and address nations. A priest got security from sacrifices and offerings. A prophet got no security at all. God says, I've called you to be a prophet. See, God called him to a tough task. It's a tough task. Being a son or daughter, advancing the kingdom of God, standing for righteousness in boardrooms, in tough economic times, it's a tough task. No, that doesn't honor the laws of our land. This does. Sitting with an accountant the other day who's just lost a big account because they wouldn't move forward in a certain direction, asked him, and they said, I'd rather walk away from your business. Please get someone else to do your books. That's called the kingdom of God advancing. That should be on the highlights reel of our reach, of our highlights vision Sunday. See, it's, it's people standing. And I want to ask, and, and what's your excuse? What's the last big task God called you to, and what's your excuse? I can tell you all of mine. I can tell you they're thousands, and I'm really, really good at excuses. And our world's really, really good at excuses. Love chatting too. There's a guy who's been stepped up and said, I'm going to put my hand up. I really know about sound, but I'm going to do sound. He stepped up and become an amazing resource and life to this church named Stu. And his sister, Michelle, in the midst of lockdown, lost everything, lost all their work. And they just pivoted. They trusted God. And they've stepped into a new business, new direction. And they're seeing fruitfulness. Why? It takes courage. It takes courage. And, and they're probably not equipped. New career paths or bringing someone into your business because God says that's good for the kingdom of God advancing. Again, I mentioned the name Lee Muller, a teacher driving into a tough, tough area of our city that many would go, it's too tough a task. So we've got to lose excuse number one, I'm not equipped. Number two, I'm not ready. And again, verse six, alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. Again, sounds so humble. 
<laughs> we find amazing ways to make our excuses so humble. And yes, Mark, this sounds heavy. I'm trying to remind us and make sure we got clarity of vision so we can move forward. This guy was 20 to 25 years old. He was young. He was young. He lived in the age where it was your wisdom that came from years rather than your followers on Instagram that got you authority. It's a different age. Age was a thing. He, he realized that it's, it's not so much his revealing of age, but he's challenging and he's revealing his immaturity. And he's saying to God, I'm not the guy. But what does God say? God says in Jeremiah 1 verse 7, Then the Lord said to me, Do not say, I'm only a youth, for you will go to everyone I send you and speak whatever I tell you. Why? Because he didn't have to come up with the words. He just had to share what God was saying. Some of you are scared to step, and I know myself, I'm scared to step sometimes, and I come up with justifiable, humble-sounding excuses, but you know what the challenge is? The kingdom of God's not advancing. God's pulling us. He's reached us. He's raised us up so that we can be released wide for the kingdom of God. See, God always equips those He calls. It's not just a nice statement we throw out at church, oh, God, it's the wrong guy. No, God, it's the right guy. Will you allow me to equip you? Oh, Mark, I'm too old. I, I, this, is good. this is a church for the young people to run. No, it's not. We need every single person advancing the kingdom of God in these times. You guys are right. You're very quiet. You're right at home. Excuse number three, just Jeremiah's, of course, not ours. Uh, it's not the right time. Again, verse nine, the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I've put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you. There's an urgency, there's a today, there's a timing in God that is not always aligned to our timing or our plans or our thoughts. I'm not financially ready. It's not going to be comfortable, that journey. If I could just press so hard with this thing, hey, God, you're asking me to start a business. We preached this preach, reached far two years ago, and a man came to me and said, I've been speaking to God. God's been speaking about starting a business. I'm going to step out and start a business. And he's thrived. I remember Inga Stain came to a time where Ryan Matthews was preaching six years ago. And Ryan was preaching, and he prophesied over Inga. In a moment, in a moment, God spoke. Honey Accounting started. An accounting firm that would stand for God, who would bring order and peace to chaotic situations. And Inga stepped out, and you know what? It was challenging. And she's, she's a lady who has to process the details of God and process faith and process. But you know what? God has raised her up. And then I get a, a sit with a businessman who I didn't know but had taken his business into Inga Stain's business, Honey Accounting. Why? Because a woman took a hold of the promises of God and realized God wants to release me wide for the kingdom of God. Yes, she prophesies at church. Yes, she leads a life group. Yes, they're an incredible part of the life of this church. But their highlights reel is out there bringing order to a chaotic world. And I'm provoking us this morning because the church loves to get insular. And if we just keep gathering, we just keep coming into this pot, we, keep, we forget that the highlights real is a big one. And it's out there and the world is watching. See, I wrote this down, so I'm going to read it. But there is wisdom in things like the timing's not right or I'm not ready. But wisdom outside of God's word and the Spirit's leading is often the excuse of the weak and not the word of the wise. And I'm speaking to my own heart this morning. Back down from many, many, many moments, many situations. The challenge for me was grade 12 being a senior in my school and getting asked to do the school assembly. An opportunity to preach in my school. You know what I did? I made an excuse. I'm going to be honest with you. Your pastor's not a hero. I made an excuse. I didn't have the guts. I didn't have the conviction. Thought as long as I'm just worshiping God with every heart on a Sunday at church, surely that's enough. I don't want to miss the moments again. And last excuse of Jeremiah says it's too risky. This is how it goes. The Lord did not give Jeremiah this joyful message of deliverance. Deliverance, you know, he gave a message of challenge, a message of judgment. That if you don't change your ways, and I'm going to preach this for 50 years, if you don't change your ways, destruction is coming. And then destruction comes and he laments, he is broken. See, what God says through us may be dangerous, but God gives us the strength to endure. There's danger. There's financial danger of stepping out the comforts of a paid salary job to step into the call of God to become an employer in tough economic times. There's challenge. There's danger. I'm not going to deny. I'm not saying everybody should be a, a, an entrepreneur. Please don't hear that. What I am saying is generally what God calls us to has a danger element every time. 
Sometimes it's just to, to love someone and in loving them and giving your heart to them, there's a danger. Your heart might get hurt. In, in giving financially in tough economic times, there's a danger. There might not be enough tomorrow, but God says, give today, and I've got to trust him for tomorrow. That's what I'm provoking. This is what I'm trying to remind us, that in the reach for our raise up, release wide, you are the highlights reel of Life Changes Church. It's you at your board meeting tomorrow, in the hospital you walk in tomorrow, in the school you teach at, where, whether you are a, a mother at home with your kids or a father at home with your kids or navigating in a school, whatever environment you find yourself in, you are the highlights reel. And we've got to make sure we redeem that. Why? Because Romans 8 says this, I consider that our present sufferings are not comparable to the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the revelation the sons of God. The world's waiting for you and I to shine. The world is waiting and groaning for you and I to bring him glory in every environment we find ourselves in. We've got to break down some of these mindsets, some of these wrong thinking, that if I do something for God at church, it's somehow more impactful than the world. I think it's the opposite. This is the training ground. This is the place we come together. This is the fuel station where we come to be fired up, fueled up, reminded, and called that we go out and change the world. That is the deepest conviction in me. And I'm a pastor. I should be telling you, come back to church every Sunday. Make this the biggest thing in your life. But I'm telling you, my job isn't that big. Jesus has already done a work in your life. He put life inside of you, and he sends you out into every environment. Whether you're interior decorators or designers building high-rise buildings in the city, God has raised you up for this time to shine for his glory. Oh, Mark, I like the comfort of being a saint in a house just sitting back. I'm telling you, there's more. That's all I want to provoke today. It's not the most... Radical. What am I not saying? Church is not important. That's what I'm not saying. What I am saying is that church is important for us for reaching and raising up and then making sure we're sending the ollies to the ends of the earth in Matuba Tuba and well beyond. I remember sitting at church, just a spectator at church back in the day, and this lady, single lady named Sandy Love, says, I'm going to go to Mongolia and teach. And I'm going, What? Where's her family? Someone tell her she's nuts. She's literally lost it. She's a single lady. How are you going to meet a dude in Mongolia? I mean, what safety is for you in Mongolia? I was just astounded, 15 years old, going, this is nuts. These elders are being irresponsible. She went to Mongolia. She started teaching. You know who was in her class? The son of the president. She got to share the gospel, the highest authority in the land, because she trusted God. I want to provoke these things. And lastly, I want to give you an image. Okay, so Chavi, stay far. Oh, good call, Jen. Chav, stay far. Stay quick. Got to stay quick. Take, making notes. Jeez. Ronda Bosch. Um, <laughs> this is our life, and this is what the gospel says. I'm going to put this here. It says, we're given seed. So our lives are seed. The moments, our time, our days, our family, my kids, they are seed for the kingdom of God. And sometimes they're going to be thrown on hard ground, and sometimes on good ground, and sometimes they're going to be bare fruit, but, but, but they're just seed. See, we get the choice of where to plant our seed. We can put it in a nice safe pot. It's a nice little pot. It's, it's a pot I can control where it goes. I can move it around quickly. It's like I've got control of that. I'm just going to plant all my seeds. We take all my seed. The problem is this tree can only grow this big because of the size of the pot. Okay, I'm going to repot. I'm going to allow God. And then I pick a bigger pot. And so maybe if I just keep pouring my seed into that pot, I can grow a tree. Well, you will grow a tree. It'll look fruitful and it'll probably bear fruit, but it'll only grow this big. God says, I want my children to shine a city on a hill. I want the seed of the kingdom to be thrown wide. I want your lives to be wide. And you know what? It's risky. You can't control where it lands, and you can't control where it gets watered. You can't control those things. My life is seed, and your life is seed. Your skills are seed. Your time is seed. Your family is seed for the kingdom of God. And you know what you can do? You can consume it. You can keep it safe. Or you can sow it for the kingdom of God. And say, God, all I can do is sow seed. Last thought, I was praying yesterday or this week and I was reminded that I can live for a crop or I can live for a harvest in my life. There's a difference. A crop can be a single fruit that comes up. That's a crop. 
a single millie that pops up. I grew up in the land of millies and sugar cane. That's a crop. It's just enough to feed me. My family will be fine. But a harvest is plentiful. A harvest speaks of more than. A harvest says you can't control the outcome. And I'm telling you, church, we are called to be a people who see the harvest in our lives. Maybe you're challenged and maybe you're slightly offended this morning because you like the idea that church is comfortable. And I'm telling you, it's got to become the most uncomfortable place for us. Why? Because the Spirit of God reminds us, He's a mission, the ends of the earth. Oh, he's a dentist. He's going there to fix teeth. He's not going there to fix teeth. He's going there to preach the gospel because he's been touched by Jesus. He's been changed by Jesus. He's been transformed by Jesus. He's been raised up in a Jesus community full of faith and courage. So when he goes to Matuba Tuba, I know revival is in Matuba Tuba because he's there. So when people leave church, it's not, oh, where are you going? Oh, we're going to this nation or that nation or this place. I'm going, come on, God. Start revival in the nation that they're going to. Start revival in the town that they're going to. Start revival there. Why? Because they are revival carriers. Say this, I'm a revival carrier. You've got to say it with more conviction than that. I'm a revival carrier. You are. You are. Will you stand with me this morning? I realize maybe it was a slightly different preach, but I want to make sure that just like it was for free or for free, we're on the same page. Because I don't think God gave us His Son on a cross to die so we could do good church together. I don't believe that. I believe God allowed His Son to die on a cross, and we're going to speak about that in the weeks to come. So that you and I, touched by that blood, healed by that blood, restored by that blood, are sent out into the kitchens of the city, into the boardrooms, into the classrooms, to shine for Jesus. And it is our privilege to preach the gospel that provokes you to shine there. Shine more out there than you do here. Shine, shine. When my kids go to school and I drop them off my prayers, God, let them shine for you. And I'm watching my little boy, he's writing a letter to a school, applying for, a, for an opportunity to go to that school. In the letter he goes, I love Jer- Jesus and I'm very serious about my faith. Just after I played first team cricket. It's like the one rolled into the other. It's no different for him. Going, let him shine. You'll have him where you want him to be, but let him shine. Will you shine for Jesus? Because then you know what we're doing? We're advancing the kingdom of God. And maybe no one will ever know the name Life Changes. Honestly, I don't care. But if they know that I'm Jesus, and that name touches their lives, I've lived every dream I could ever have. Can we close our eyes for a second? I need to release you this morning, but I pray, Spirit of God, more than my zeal, more than my passion this morning, would you begin to reveal where the boundaries are too close in our lives because we put the white stones in areas of safety rather than asking God how far, where God. And remind us as the church that the mission is massive and the gospel that we preach is glorious. And whatever our pulpit, the cameras of heaven are rolling. The highlights are the seeds of heaven through the sons and daughters of the living God sowing wide. Is it dangerous? Well, to my eyes, maybe. But if my king is with me, if my king is with you, it's the safest place we could ever be. Pray, Spirit of God, would you put your hand on your heart as we finish the series and finish the flip the script series? today Spirit of God speak to us at home this morning wherever people find themselves around the world or in this room this morning I pray God break our hearts for what breaks yours align our hearts with the rhythms of heaven so that you can get all the glory mighty King Amen